Have you he- have, let us hear what you want us to hear today. Lord, use Jess and just to preach your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andersons. Appreciate your reading the scriptures and praying. Thank you, Jen, for the reminder that God's song also invo- involves sounds of nature. I like that. That's fresh. And anybody else appreciating the Heston singers over here? I got a round of applause. Yeah. I'm actually kind of waiting for them to stand up and bow. Because some of us, when we were in high school, we might have had a little fun with that, right? Glad to have you guys here. It's awesome. It's awesome. So one of the Advent scriptures this week is the Philippians 4, 4 through 7 text that, that Darren read this morning. That's the first slide I have this morning. Rejoice in the Lord. And scripture says, and again, I say, rejoice. Man, I like being able to rejoice, to have joy. Anybody else? I like being able to dare to imagine God's song. Amen? And yet, I have anxieties and worries. Amen? Anybody else? So verse 6 in the NRSV says, do not worry about anything. (laughs) But I realized this week in, in preparing this message, instead of not worrying about anything, I've been worrying about everything. Can anybody relate to that? Scripture tells us to do one thing, but we can do the other thing. Not because we're bad or wrong or sinful. I think it's just because we're human. It's hard. But I drew strength from verses 6 and 7 in the message. I like this. This helped me face some of the things that I have worries or anxieties about. And, And may it help you as it helped me and continues to help me. Don't fret or worry. And hear it that way. Not like God beating you on the head with that or making you feel guilty. I think we have enough stuff to feel guilty about, right? Hear a calm voice from the Lord. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. That's hard to do. Let petitions which are requests, let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. I love that. Because we have things we worry about that we're anxious about, right? And we think about it. And some of us think about it over and over and over again, right? What if we shaped it into a prayer? God, help me with. God, I'm really thinking about this. God, help me with this. And then Peterson writes here in this paraphrase, and before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of of your life, and then we can rejoice, right? Then it's a whole lot easier to rejoice in the Lord. May this help you this week, as inevitably worry or anxieties come at you, that you can form them and shift them into prayers, amen? So at this point, I wanna invite you to stand And greet those around you. Acknowledge them. And if you're brave, look at the cameras. We've got one here, one here. Acknowledge those persons as well. Would you do that this morning?
So many of us know that Advent is a time of thoughtful preparation for the celebration of Christ's birth. So the next slide I have this morning. Did you know that Christians have observed Advent for over a thousand years? And this idea of Jesus being the light of the world has been around and celebrated and tapped into for ages. So we have candles on the Advent wreath. They represent hope, peace, joy is the, the different color candle, and love. And then the tall white one is the Christ candle. And we light that one that Christmas Eve or on, on Christmas. And to me, that keeps it all into focus because Jesus is the light of the world. And from Jesus, we get hope and peace and love and joy. I also love this verse, John 8, 12, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I don't know about you, but I need the light of life. Anybody else? There's plenty of darkness. There's plenty of unknowns. There's plenty of evil that can be darkness. There's plenty of struggle. I need, we need Jesus to be the light of life. And I hope in the next week, two weeks, as you see Christmas lights around the community, that you don't just think, ah, oh, that's pretty. Or some of you in your sarcastic way might say, man, that's ugly. I don't like that kind. But this concept, as you see light, the recognized Jesus is our light to help us with our darkness. And so during Advent, we've explored expanded versions of the Advent themes. Two weeks ago, we used the theme, Dare to Imagine God's Goodness. Last week, the theme was Dare to Imagine God's Embrace. And this Sunday, the theme, and you see in the bullet, and you've heard it already, dare to imagine God's song. So if you're like me, you might ask a question, and that's the next slide. What might imagining God's song look like? I thought of a few things. Your thoughts might be different than mine this morning, but I invite you to hear these. So for Mary, in that Luke 1 passage that was read this morning, imagining God's song meant for Mary that God's salvation and help is for her. A young, likely teenager or even preteen who was facing tremendous Unknown. God's song and imagining God's song was for her to be able to say, God can and will help me with my life. And then later on in that Luke 1 passage, she sings in what is often called Mary's song. Imagining God's song also means God's salvation, God's help is being brought to the humble, the broken, the poor the hungry. God's song is not just for the rich and powerful and the elite. I like that. I need to know that, that it's not just for the elite. This justice help aspect is part of God's song. So another way of imagining God's song is there's a text in Zephaniah that's been kind of referred to a bit in some of our, our litanies, but also in, in some of our prayers. And it's, it's really interesting because Zephaniah is not a text or a, a book that's read often. And I won't ask for a show of hands for how many of you know where Zephaniah is. Or if I said Zephaniah is in the, right close to the book of Hezekiah, I won't say that either. 
And some of you are laughing because there's not a book of Hezekiah. But the point about Zephaniah is it's interesting. There's, there's lots of negativity in this, in this book, and it's three chapters long, and yet this part jumps out. The Lord your God is with you. God is mighty to save. God will rejoice over you with gladness. God will re renew you in his love. God will exalt over you with loud singing. I never thought of that really before. But God exalts over us. God sings over us. What? Then I got to thinking about it. I remember holding my first grandchild. And she had, uh, let's just say she cried a lot. <laughs> and I remember holding her. And then as a grandparent, I had a whole lot more patience than when I was a parent. Okay? And so holding her, I sang over her. I sang over her with gladness with joy, with love. Eventually, she settled down. But I think about that with us a bit. God is gladdened by us. God can look at us and think of all the possibilities. God sings over us. So that's an image of, for me from that Zephaniah text. And then... There's this song, it's actually in our hymnal, 173, and I first, don't worry, I'm not going to sing it this morning, <laughs> but I remember this song first when I was, uh, I was a staff person, I was the Bible leader at Camp Luz in Ohio, so it's the Camp Menescal equivalent or Rocky Mountain Camp in Ohio, and I remember they would sing this song at the end of the campfire services each time, and I think we've sung it once or twice here in church. And I love the song. And I especially love my middle daughter. She was also on staff that summer in Camp Luz. And so she would play this on the piano and sing it. Listen to the lyric, 173. The Lord your God is with you. And imagine how our lives would be changed if, if we embrace that the creator of heaven and earth is with us. Who is mighty to save. This God is mighty to save, to help us with what we struggle with. God will take great joy in you. I believe that. God will quiet you with his love. And God will rejoice over you with singing, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love this. And I just want to say, it's hard to embrace that we're good enough. Sometimes it's hard for us, especially as we age, to embrace that, that God loves us enough to sing over us. But it's true. It's true. So also this week, as I thought about this idea, what does imagining God's song, what does that mean to me? Where and how can I experience deep and meaningful joy? Do you ever ask yourself those questions? Where and how can you experience deep and meaningful joy? So I'm thinking about this, and, and one of the things when I preach, I like to think about the so what question. And you can just talk about joy, and, and you can read scriptures, rejoice in the Lord always. You can say, God sings over you with joy, but still there's some of us, we've got a block. So what? And I re realized after a time of, of thinking about this, that giving and receiving forgiveness, that's a way I experience deep and abiding joy. By giving and receiving forgiveness. 
And that's the next slide. I believe receiving and giving forgiveness is a way to experience God's song, and it can help you have deep and abiding joy. And if I have a hope this morning, is that you will grab on to this concept of forgiveness, not just for Advent, but, but very much relevant for Advent, very much relevant for Christmas and beyond. And it's not just receiving forgiveness, but it's also granting and giving forgiveness. So I have a couple thoughts on forgiveness. First one is, I believe receiving forgiveness from God is an important first step. 1 John 1, 9 reads, if we confess, if we name, if we own up to our sins, God is faithful and will forgive us our sins. I think that's a good starting place. But I also love Romans 8, 1, where Paul is writing to the church in Romans, in Rome, and he says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So my experience is, and, and Andy read that this morning, that we're all sinners and we all come short of the glory of God. Amen? But sometimes just saying that generally is different than accepting for yourself what is your issue. And if your issue, one of them might be unforgiveness in a certain area with a certain person or a certain group of people, and it might be really hard to get there. And let's say you do the, the heart-wrenching work of facing your sin and taking a step in a healthy direction, and then life happens, and more struggle comes at you, and likely in that same area, there is significant condemnation that can come towards you, significant guilt that can come on us, that sets us back. And I want to say, be aware of that. That's part of the journey. It's a wrestle, but it's part of the journey. So I have this somewhat light story that to me illustrates is we have to work at it to not allow ourself or others or even the evil one from pummeling us with condemnation. Some of you have probably heard this story, but listen this morning. There was a little boy and his older sister visiting grandparents on their farm. The boy was given a slingshot to play with out in the woods. He practiced in the woods, but he could never hit the target. <sighs> Getting a little discouraged, he headed back for dinner. As he was walking back, he saw Grandma's pet duck. Can you imagine that pretty duck waddling around the farmyard? Just out of impulse, the boy let the slingshot fly. He hit the duck square in the head and killed it. He was shocked and grieved. In a panic, he hid the dead duck in the woodpile only to see his sister watching. Sally has seen it all, but she didn't say anything. After lunch the next day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, Grandma, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen. Then she whispered to Johnny, remember the duck? <laughs> so Johnny did the dishes. Later that day, Grandpa asked if the children wanted to go fishing and swimming. And Grandma said, oh, I'm sorry, but I, I need Sally to help with supper. Sally just smiled and said, well, that's all right, because Johnny told me he wanted to help. She whispered again. Remember the duck? 
So Sally went fishing and swimming, and Johnny stayed to help. After several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's, he finally couldn't stand it any longer. Can a brother get an amen? <laughs> he came to Grandma, and he confessed that he had killed the duck. Grandma knelt down and said, Sweetheart, I know. You see, I was standing at the window, and I saw the whole thing. Because I love you, I forgave you. But I was wondering how long you would let Sally make a slave out of you. Church, I believe receiving forgiveness from God is an important first step. And then fighting off condemnation that can come from other people, that can come from ourselves even, and certainly comes from the evil one. A second thought about forgiveness. This is next slide. If you don't forgive sins or work, at forgiving sins. What are you going to do with them? What are you going to do with them? But Pastor Jess, you don't know. I don't. But I do know the negative power of holding on to stuff. And when I'm talking forgiveness, I'm not just talking about letting somebody off the hook. I'm saying you could still have boundaries and there are things like that that you need to pay attention to. But church, as a matter of principle, if you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? Forgiveness isn't always easy. Amen? It is not always easy. And don't take that away from this service. It's hard, hard work. It can be a journey, a process. It's not a one-time deal. It's something you have to visit and revisit and revisit. Some of us have to revisit it every Christmas or every New Year or every Easter or whenever you have deeply embedded pain. And I say to you, brothers and sisters, you are not alone with that. But if you don't forgive sin, what are you going to do with them? God can handle them. Jesus can help you with them. But it's a process. It's not easy. It's a journey. And you can form your process of forgiveness into a regular prayer. I remember a woman who hurt me deeply years ago, and then someday I was driving down the road, and this person's face just came up in my memory. And I'm like, where did that come from? And I felt the anger rising up inside of me. And I took a deep breath, and I realized, I forgive them. And I needed to say that. And I needed to do my own work, and I needed to unpack that. I need to keep paying attention to that. Last slide I have this morning. This is from Henry Nowen in his book, Here and Now. And you see the garbage? That's garbage. It's nasty. Imagine if that was your job to clean it up. It's a little bit, to me, what unforgiveness can look like. It's just garbage. But Nowen says, and I love this, there is so much to forgive. There is so much. 
to forgive. couple excerpts from Nowen's book. He writes, Can we forgive our family for not having loved us as well as we wanted to be loved? Can we forgive our parents perhaps for being demanding, authoritarian, or indifferent, unaffectionate, absent, or simply more interested in other people or things than in us? There is so much to forgive. Can we forgive our parents for being perhaps possessive, scrupulous, controlling, preoccupied, addicted to food, alcohol, drugs, whatever, or being overly busy, or simply more concerned with a career than with us? There's so much to forgive. And if we don't forgive, what are we going to do with it? Can we forgive friends, co-workers? Oh, now here's the kicker. Don't sleep on this church. Can we forgive fellow church members? There's so much to forgive. Once we are able to forgive... It is a whole lot easier to be grateful for what we have, for what we have received. And friends, we have received much. We can walk, talk, smile, move, laugh, cry, eat, drink, dance, play, work, sing, give life, give joy, give hope, give love. We are alive. Who of you doesn't want to live? Because none of us knows how much time we have. Church, we can experience God's song, God's joy. We can rejoice. And we can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, we can rejoice. I'm going to invite the singers to come forward and get ready for the...